Gravity. We all know gravity exists, but did you ever stop to ask yourself the big question, why? Now, there's a lot of other questions we could ask, and I don't mean the same thing as the question, how, but why? Why, if we have two things that have this property of mass, are they attracted to each other? Why does this property of mass go together with this property of gravity? And again, I don't mean how. We might understand more in the future about how gravity works, about how masses pull each other together. But the question of why is a fundamental question that evolutionists cannot answer. And it forces us to see in the universe around us the design of a creator. Gravity is absolutely fundamental to the operation of the universe. Not only without gravity would you not return to Earth if you jumped, but our planet would not be orbiting around the sun. And we all know that our location relative to the sun is absolutely fundamental for life on Earth. So I encourage you to ask yourselves questions like this and to understand that throughout nature, we can really see that our universe could not have come together just by a random chance. And that even in things like gravity, we can always see design. We can see intelligent design and we can see evidence of a creator. I want to talk in this video basically about two things. The first one is tides. So on a big scale, sort of what is one effect that gravity has. And this is not as fundamental to, of course, the planets rotating around the sun. But it's still a very interesting occurrence of the way gravity affects us here on this earth. And then I'm also going to talk about experiments that have been done to try to prove that all masses have gravity and exactly how strong that gravity is. So let's start with looking at these tides. You may have already known that tides result from the attraction of the moon, the gravitational interaction with the moon. So, for example, all the water on the earth is pulled toward the moon. But it's not only the water close to the Earth. We should see all the water being pulled toward the Moon. Wherever there's water existing on Earth, that it's pulled toward the Moon. Now, we also know that gravity is the strongest when the objects, the masses, are closer together. So to be accurate here, I should have drawn the water closest to the Moon being pulled with the largest force. At the midpoint, there that water is pulled with sort of a medium force, and at the far side of the Earth, the water is being pulled with a little bit less force. Now, that by itself might convince you as to why there's a tide on the side of the Earth that is close to the Moon. So we could kind of imagine that this side of the Earth here is bulging toward the Moon. Okay, and that's because that water... Well, Earth is very, there's very much water on Earth, of course, and all the water can be pulled sort of in that direction and sort of creates a bulge, so that's a high tide. And then you're going to say, well, where does that water come from? The places that the water flows from are going to be areas of low tide. And the obvious choice for that is going to be right over here. But that's actually not the case. If that was the case, we'd only have one high tide per day as your side of the Earth went past the moon. But actually, we have two high tides per day, and the other high tide happens to be on the side that is away from the moon. So we actually have another bulge, sort of, in the ocean water on this side opposite the moon. So you should ask yourself, why? Why would that ever be? That can't be from the gravity of the moon. Well, yes and no. No, that water is not moving out from the gravity of the moon. But what is moving from the moon is the Earth. So if you think of the mass of the Earth that is being pulled toward the moon and it's sort of leaving the water behind. So we've got this ocean water being pulled the strongest toward the moon. Then we've got the earth being pulled toward the moon and this water over here is sort of being left behind. It has the smallest attraction toward the moon of anything. And so when we look at that all together, that will explain why the opposite side is also a high tide. And then we get our area of low tide sort of in a circle through the middle, I guess halfway in between there, that that would be areas of low tide. So when you're passing this point in the front, then you have low tide. And so if you take this concept further, you can see why perhaps those two tides might not be the same size. You know, one of the high tides might be a little higher than the other one because there's different interactions going on. It also helps us to explain why 
if we add the sun to this interaction, not to scale, if the sun was pulling in the same direction as the moon, we're going to have an extra high tide because exactly the same interactions are going on. If the sun was opposite, on the opposite side of the earth as the moon, we're also going to have an extra high tide, but not exactly for the same reason, right? It's sort of, it's working in the opposite way then, but we're still going to have an extra high tide because, again, these high tide waters are, are being pulled extra toward the sun, and the earth in between is kind of in the middle of the fight. So tide can obviously be studied in a lot more depth than this, but I just wanted to give you the basic idea of why the tides occur, and it is an interesting effect due to gravity. Now the next question is, well, okay, so I know that planets have gravity, or the only one I've experienced is Earth, but I, I agree that Earth has gravity. But this still begs the question, people tell me, does every mass have gravity? People tell me that's true, that every single mass has this property of gravity, that every mass attracts every other mass. So do you agree with that? I've never seen other masses suddenly be attracted to each other. I've not felt attracted to other people as they walk past me. I don't feel like I get sucked into a massive wall as I walk beside it. So how can we prove that every mass has gravity? Well, scientists have tried to do this before, and there's a famous experiment called the Cavendish experiment. And it was set up kind of like this diagram here. So this was called the Cavendish experiment, named obviously after a guy called Cavendish. And he sort of used this setup to prove that Newton was actually right when he said that there's this law of universal gravitation. So there's a force of gravity between every mass that is equal to g times m1 times n2 divided by r squared. And later on, this same setup from Cavendish was actually used to figure out what exactly that value of g was. So it was a very precise measuring tool that was necessary in order to figure out that exact value for capital G, for the universal gravitational constant, as it's called. So Newton already said, I think every single mass has gravity. And Cavendish went around to basically prove him, like a good scientist would do. Is he right or is he not right? And so he set up this fancy system we've got here. Now this is, a, of course, a diagram and it's a modern version because in Cavendish's time, he didn't have access necessarily to the same materials that we do. But you can see the red masses have a small lowercase m in them. Those are small masses, and the gray masses are large masses. So here's a large one, and the red ones are both small ones. So imagine you take those large masses away, the gray ones, and you just have the small red ones, and they're hanging on this torsion wire. Torsion wire is kind of a wire that sort of has some resistance to being rotated. So these masses were actually originally hanging in the, in the sort of grayed out sections, grayed out masses here. That's where they originally were. That's where they naturally hung on that torsion wire. But the interesting thing is when you introduce the gray masses onto the scene, then those red masses slightly begin to rotate toward the large gray masses. And that's the blue arrows that you see in the diagram. That's the motion that happens when the gray masses are introduced onto this setup. Now, it's, it's very small because unless your masses are really huge, there's not a huge force. So we need to very carefully and very precise, precisely measure this. And one example of the way that that would be done would be um, uh, on this bar, there might be a, a reflector. So I'm just going to sketch in a, a plate right here. And then a laser beam can be shined at that reflector. And by watching the reflection of that laser from that little reflecting piece, we can actually see, we could, we could measure if we wanted to with a ruler, if we had a ruler set up over here, we could measure the deflection of that laser as this thing rotates ever so slightly. So this experiment proved that it's not only big things like planets, but even masses that we can see and feel and handle ourselves, they also have gravity. And that this gravity is really a special property of these things that we call masses.